The majority of you watching this video will already be aware that the Child's Play franchise revolving around a homicidal doll named Chucky has been insanely popular ever since its initial first movie release in 1988. The franchise boasts eight movies, including the last one being a reboot of the original 1988 movie released in 2019. Not including the movies, the franchise has spawned short films, TV shows, comic book strips, and even theme park attractions. The majority of those who enjoy Child's Play in similar franchises simply enjoy horror and wouldn't dare do anything to harm anybody else. But for the subjects of this video, it is not the case. Unfortunately, not many people know about Suzanne Kappa and her resilience and bravery despite what she went through, because only a few months after the case of James Bulger broke. This was a particularly horrific crime and I will link videos down in the description and in the cards if you would like to know more about that. Unlike Suzanne's case, the Bulger case also was linked to the Child's Play franchise. And in 2009, an attack on a nine-year-old was also linked to the Chucky universe, meaning that the franchise is fairly notorious, at least over here. However, because the media was so focused on reporting on the Bulger case, Suzanne's story was never really heard and not a lot of people know about her, and I intend to rectify that with this video. A fair warning, for those who know about the case of Suzanne Kappa, it's considered the most sadistic crime to ever happen in the United Kingdom. Please watch at your own discretion. Suzanne Jane Kappa was born on September 1st in 1976 in Moston, Manchester, United Kingdom. She had one older sister, Michelle, and some sources state that she had a brother called John. Her mother was named Elizabeth Dunbar and Suzanne was estranged from her father who refused to have anything to do with her. Elizabeth later married a man named John Kappa, but the relationship was dysfunctional and there were frequent arguments and tension. When Suzanne was 14 in 1990, her parents divorced. Suzanne and Michelle spent time in care, staying with their stepfather, occasionally with their mother, and they sometimes stayed on friends' and family sofas for the next two years. At the time of the case, December 1992, Suzanne was living with her stepfather and Michelle at 6 Bewley Walk. Suzanne was described as an innocent, gentle girl who just wanted someone to love her. Yet the unstable life that had no consistency led to her truanting, with teachers describing her school attendance as erratic. I tried to find other things that Suzanne might have been interested in and what she liked, but I could only find that she was also described as well-mannered and wanted to please everyone around her. She just wanted attention and love. After a time, Suzanne befriended a 26-year-old mother of three, Jean Powell, living at 97 Langworthy Road, a seven-minute walk from her own home. Jean had babysat Suzanne from when she was 10 and began spending more time at the home. 97 Langworthy Road hosted many different characters. 24-year-old Bernadette McNeely was also a mother of three, initially living at 91 Langworthy Road, but by the time of the case was living in Jean's house, number 97. Both women dealt drugs and sold stolen goods. Others that frequented were Glyn Powell, Jean's 29-year-old ex-husband, Anthony Dudson, Bernadette's 16-year-old boyfriend. Don't worry, we're judging her, but there'll be more to judge her on as we go on to this case, so quite frankly, the 16-year-old boyfriend is the least of our trouble. Clifford Pook slash Hayes, sometimes he goes by Pook, sometimes it's Hayes, was Jean's 17-year-old brother, and last but not least, Jeffrey Lay, a 26-year-old man known for assaulting and stealing from his 86-year-old grandmother. A gentleman. Suzanne would spend more and more time at 97 Langworthy Road, sometimes babysitting Jean's children. Jean and Bernadette learned they could manipulate and take advantage of the 16-year-old Suzanne, and Jean would convince her to skip school and go to work with her as a cleaner, and then take the majority of Suzanne's wages for herself. When Suzanne's mother Elizabeth discovered this, she confronted Jean, who retaliated by threatening to burn her house down. Is anyone wondering why Jean was described as a powerful and dominating woman? 
Michelle, Suzanne's sister, even lived with Jean for a short time before Bernadette moved in, but moved out as she disliked the company that would come over. Even though Michelle had left, Suzanne continued to go over. Peter Barlow, Michelle's fiancé, recalled a month before the case, Suzanne had come to her mother's home with a black eye but was turned away. Michelle witnessed it, saying after, if she had helped Suzanne, she might be alive today. She is a heartless mother. Suzanne reportedly also told her neighbour that Jean had held her hostage for four days and had beat her. Nothing was done to help Suzanne. Her stepfather did want her to stop visiting 97 Langworthy Road, however. He said nothing good happened there. He was right. December 7th, 1992. Glyn, Jean, Bernadette and Anthony discovered they all had pubic lice. Likely as Anthony was sleeping with both Bernadette and Jean, and Jean was sleeping with Glyn, all unprotected. But they blamed Suzanne, saying the lice must have been brought in by her and spread via the bed she sometimes slept in. In case you're wondering, that's impossible. A £50 duffel coat was also missing from the home, and Suzanne was again blamed, though it was likely taken by one of the dozens who came in and out all the time. They decided to enact revenge, going to Suzanne's stepfather's home on 6 Bewley Walk and told her a boy she liked was at 97 Langworthy Road waiting for her. So she willingly walked with them to the house. Accompanied by Jean and Bernadette, Suzanne entered the house only to be grabbed and restrained by Anthony and Glenn. This is where the first of seven days of torment would begin. If you do not want to hear what happened in those days, I will leave a timestamp both in the description and on screen for you to skip to. The group forced Suzanne to shave her hair, eyebrows and pubic hair before forcing her to clean it up herself. A plastic bag was forced over her head and she was suffocated while they beat her, both with their bare hands and with objects such as a belt, as she lay in the fetal position. Bernadette locked Suzanne in a closet where she remained for the rest of the night, crying. Now, remember, there are six children in this house, three of Jean's and three of Bernadette's. They became concerned that Suzanne's cries would disturb and alert them. Thus, the next morning, the group moved Suzanne to Bernadette's previous and now abandoned home, 91 Langworthy Close. Her torment had only just begun. Suzanne was stripped naked and tied to a mattress with electrical wires and chains. Socks were stuffed in her mouth to muffle her screams. The group injected her with amphetamines to keep her awake and ensured that she felt everything the group would do to her over the next six days. As well as Jean, Bernadette, Anthony and Glyn, Clifford, Jean's brother, and Geoffrey would also come over to number 91 to participate in tormenting Suzanne. She was regularly beaten, Jean once allegedly spending two hours beating Suzanne by herself. She was burned with cigarette butts. At one point, Clifford took out a pair of pliers and forced Suzanne to open her mouth. He began hitting her teeth with the tool before gripping a front tooth and started pulling. The tooth snapped and chipped, so Clifford hit it again and then went back to pulling until the tooth came out. He repeated the process with a second tooth. Suzanne was also tormented with music, which is where child's play enters the picture. She was forced to constantly listen to the rave song, Hi, I'm Chucky, Wanna Play, by 150 volts, that featured sound bites from the Chucky movies on maximum volume. Bernadette would sometimes enter the room and start her torment sessions with Suzanne by saying, Chucky's coming to play. Some reports say that Susan was essayed, but I couldn't find an official source that verified this. When Suzanne had become unbearable to smell due to her lying in her own urine and feces for days, they took her to the bathroom and bathed her in bleach and disinfectant, and scrubbed her with a broom so hard that some of her skin peeled off. For the benefit of those who have decided to skip to this timestamp, I will give you a brief and undetailed version of what happened to Suzanne during the seven days she was held captive by Jean, Bernadette, Anthony, Glyn, Clifford and Geoffrey, the six individuals that frequented 97 Langworthy Road. They kept Suzanne captive for seven days without food and water and regularly mistreated her in brutal ways. During this period, John Capper, Suzanne's stepfather, became worried. It wasn't unusual for Suzanne not to come home for a few days, but it had been a week at this point. 
The kidnappers learned from Michelle that he intended to report her missing to the police. They needed to get rid of Suzanne. On the 14th of December 1992, Glyn, Bernadette, Anthony and Jean drove a weak and incoherent Suzanne to the outskirts of Stockport, 13 to 15 miles away. Bernadette forced Suzanne out of the boot of the car. Suzanne, who could barely stand, fell down, but Bernadette forced her to get back up again before pushing her into a ditch. Bernadette then poured a canister of petrol over Suzanne. It took three attempts for Glynn to set her alight. The group drove away singing the song, Burn, Baby, Burn. But Suzanne was still alive. She managed to pull herself out of the ditch and walked a quarter of a mile before she came across three men on their way to work. They took her up the road to a house where they knew an elderly couple lived, the Coops. Mr. Coop said, both her hands appeared like ash, her legs were like raw meat and her feet appeared to be badly charred. I was struck by how polite the victim was. She was constantly thanking my wife for her assistance. Suzanne drank six glasses of water but needed help lifting the glass to her lips and was in so much pain she pulled away when Mrs. Coop tried to hug her as she couldn't bear to be touched. The ambulance arrived and Suzanne was taken to Withington Hospital, Manchester. 70 to 80% of her body was burned and she had to be ID'd via a partial fingerprint. But Suzanne was strong enough to provide police with the names of her kidnappers and tormentors and Jean's address. The same day they tried to kill her, every single one of them were arrested all found at 97 Langworthy Road. However, Suzanne slipped into a coma. It's unknown if it was medically induced to preserve her energy or if it was natural. Sadly, she passed away four days later on the 18th of December, 1992, only 16 years old. Anthony was the first to break down and confessed after his father told him to tell the truth. Police officers were unable to remain composed and cried after hearing the full extent of Suzanne's ordeal. The trial was November 1993 and revealed missed opportunities to save Suzanne. 19 year old Daniel Hill was asked to sit in and watch the house while the others went out. Before Anthony left, Daniel heard him yell, shut up you slag from upstairs and asked him what was going on. Anthony showed him Suzanne tied to the bed. She had a sort of cloth over her face from just above the eyebrows and covering her nose. She had a bit of dried blood on her lip. She had no hair. She asked me if I could help, but I told her I couldn't. I asked her who she was. She said her name was Suzanne. She asked me if I could untie her. I said I couldn't do anything. I thought they would batter me. If I'd said anything, they'd have all got me, wouldn't they? I didn't know what to do. I was too shocked to do anything. Jean Powell, Glyn Powell, and Bernadette McNeely were all sentenced to life with 25 years before the possibility of parole. Clifford Pook was sentenced to 15 years before the possibility of parole. Jeffrey Lay was sentenced to 12 years before the possibility of parole. Anthony Dudson was also sentenced to life in prison. Jeffrey appealed in 1994 and his sentence was reduced from a minimum of 12 years to nine, but was released early in 1998. Anthony appealed in 2002 and the minimum was reduced from 18 years to 16. He tried to appeal a second time, but this was rejected in 2003. In 2013, the parole board approved Anthony's release. In response to this, Suzanne's mother, Elizabeth, said she was devastated. Clifford was released early in 2001. As far as I'm aware, Glyn and Jean are still in prison. Jean finalised their divorce in prison and is now Jean Gillespie. Bernadette was released a year early for being a model prisoner, but had previously been transferred from HM Prison Durham to HM Prison New Hall after letters revealed she was having an affair with the prison governor, Mike Martin. She was also friends with Myra Hindley and Rose West in prison. I'll link a video about Myra Hindley in the description and I've also covered Rose West in a video of my own. She's also now friends on the outside with Karen Matthews. I'll link a video about her too. I find it utterly repulsive that four out of six of Suzanne Kappa's tormentors are currently walking free. 
including two out of four of her killers. Most shockingly of all, Bernadette, who was the ringleader, who clearly found joy in what she did to Suzanne, saying Chucky's here to play before tormenting her, being the one that initially locked her in the closet in 97 Langworthy Road, being the one who poured the canister of petrol over her. Bernadette was arguably the main figure in what happened to Suzanne, alongside Clifford who pulled her teeth out, and both of them are free. I would like to take a moment for Suzanne. Suzanne Jane Capper, born September 1st, 1976 to December 18th, 1992, aged 16. She is buried at Blackley Cemetery and crematorium. I would specifically like to send out my condolences to her mother, Elizabeth Dunbar, her stepfather, John Capper, and her sister, Michelle. I am so sorry for your loss. Uh, there are no words to describe what you must be feeling, and there's nothing that I can say to make it better. I hope that you're managing to carry on and be happy and healthy in yourselves and remembering the best of Suzanne as you do. She was a kind, gentle, innocent girl with incredible manners, even in the harshest circumstances. With such a great heart, she will be missed. Thank you to everybody who watched this video and listened to Suzanne's story. I will be linking a fundraiser in the YouTube fundraiser feature for a related charity, so please donate if you are able, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.